that's one open question. Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, first I go over some of the student questions we have received or I have received by email and also in the exercise sessions. And again, uh, I want to highlight, please do not hesitate to ask if anything is unclear, write an email to the teachers or the, to the TAs. It's not a shame to ask anything. It's only a shame if you didn't use the opportunity to ask for help. That's the only shame. Okay, so one question was, um, I'm not sure if I understood the project requirements on the lecture. It was stated that we don't need to code. Can the project be like some using some algorithms to predict the grade of, of a tumor? Um, for example, using logistic regression and using uh, one feature. Yes. So uh, I want to highlight again, this course is not about uh, implementing, does not focus on implementing machine learning algorithms. For this, we have the hands-on course, Machine Learning with Python, which now started. And I think it's still possible to enroll in this course. So if you want to uh, try out machine learning in Python, please enroll to this other course. In this course, you will not need to code anything. And today I will demonstrate you how you can do machine learning using Excel, using spreadsheets. So uh, you can formulate your student project such that you get along with just using Excel or spreadsheet software. Uh, then here's a question on the chat. How will the project be graded if there is no code? Uh, the project will be graded based on a report. So the important thing about the project is that you write down what you did and how you model uh, some real life aspect as a machine learning problem, similar to the first assignment. The first assignment is currently running and the deadline is on Friday. So the next, this Friday already is the first deadline. Uh, this brings me to the next questions. Uh, yeah, there was one question uh, about the quizzes. So there might be more than one correct answer. So for one single quiz question, there might be several options correct. Another question on the chat. I haven't understand clearly what is the difference between feature and data point. Yeah, I will talk about this uh, uh, in a second. So I will repeat a bit the notion of a data point. Um, yeah. Do many of you have a, a, a bad noise quality? So my, my voice, is it very noisy? Let me see, voice is good and clear. I just quickly check um, if I have my microphone. Yeah, it's the external microphone. Yeah, so I think it's it's the problem on the other end. And not in my case in this. Yes, so the sound is good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so there can be more, more than one answer option correct in each quiz and we don't, we don't tell you how many. So this is a part of the challenge. Um, yes, so as I said, the first deadline is already this Friday, this Friday in the evening. So one minute before midnight, local Helsinki time you have to finish your first assignment, which is to formulate a machine learning uh, machine learning problem. Yeah, uh, there was now one question about to recap the first slide just uh, quickly, but in general, we, we will record this session. So I will now uh, exceptionally repeat. So the first question was about uh, if there is coding required for the project, and this is not the case. So you don't need to code. You can use Python for your student project, but you can also use an Excel spreadsheet. And I will in this lecture, I will show you how to do machine learning with an Excel spreadsheet. And this is the minimum requirement um, I set for, for using machine learning. Okay, so um, don't worry if you now join in later, we will record the session and make it available again. So regarding the first assignment, your machine learning problem, uh, you have to you have to first assess the example submissions. So when you hit the your machine learning problem button on my courses, you are first asked to assess example submissions. And the, the role of these example submissions is to give you an idea, to give you an idea what we expect from, from you. So you have to formulate the machine learning problem by telling what are the data points that you have in your mind? What are the features that you have in your mind to characterize the data points? What is the label? 
and where do you think you could get a lot of data points? And we have already quite, uh, I guess, 100 submissions. So this seems to be not a big issue. And if you have any problem, again, do not hesitate to ask the core staff by email or in the exercise sessions. The next exercise session will be tomorrow in the afternoon, I think. But please check the My Courses page. And you can also use the discussion forum, the SIP, uh, SULIP discussion forum. Okay, did I miss anything else? Yeah, what, what uh, is important again for this first assignment, you can change or modify your submission, an arbitrary number, so any anytime until Friday. So if you now submit and you find, ah, oh, the definition of data points maybe was not so good, don't worry, just modify it. You can modify it as often as you wish until Friday midnight. Okay, then uh, another question was, so the, the machine learning problem that you formulate that you formulate now in this assignment is not related to the one you you can look at the student project so the student project can be a completely different problem but you can also uh, elaborate more the problem that you started to think about in this assignment but it, it's not required that this has to be the same so the student project could be some bachelor thesis topic you you are interested in or master thesis topic or work topic anything um, another question, I have a machine learning problem, but I'm not sure if I can get real data for features. Uh, yeah, so you, you only have to speculate, where could you get data? It's also fine if you tell uh, if there could be challenges to get data, that's also fine. So you don't have to uh, provide a, a big database for data, you just should speculate, you just should give it a thought where could you get data? Because when you think about where could you get data, you might find out that maybe it's difficult to get data according to, to the definition of data points that you used and you might use a different definition of data points then. Uh, then another question, are the exercise sessions compulsory to attend? No, they are completely voluntary. Just stop by if you have questions and ask the TA there. Another question, so just to be clear, it's allowed to use Python for the implementation of the project, but it must be submitted as a PDF. Yes, so we are not asking for, for an implementation or source code. This is what you would do in the other course in machine learning with Python. In this course, we are only interested in, in the report where you specify the machine learning problem. What is the data? What is the label you're interested in? How do you measure the quality using a loss function? And uh, you should then report some results. So anything you, you have implemented, even if it's only linear regression. And you can, you can formulate the problem such that you can just use a spreadsheet as I will show you later. Okay, uh, another question, medical data of humans like blood test reports. So I'm not sure what the question here is. Yeah, it could be one possible data could be blood test, blood test reports, yes. Um, another question. I mean, I would need some medical data of humans like blood test reports. Okay, so this refers to this one project. Yeah, you can just write down uh, where you could get or if you would be a doctor at a hospital, would you get this data? One or two lines on this. So don't overthink now. This first assignment is just a quick exercise to start training you to think about data points, features and labels. Um, Another question, should the project and report be done alone or in groups? So this is a, a solo project. There's no group work in this project. Another question, what is the expected length of the report <clears throat> for your machine learning problem? So for this first assignment, uh, this should be similar to the, to the uh, example submissions. And I would say maximum 10 lines. So this is really a few lines. Just specify what are the data points you consider. What are the features of data points? What is the label, the quantity of interest of a data point and where could you get data? Just speculate about data sources. Okay, so here are more questions on the chat. Uh, what is the, I asked this already. Do you have the option of muting yourself? I'm scared that you can hear me the whole time. No, we cannot hear you because in this larger, meeting, Zoom meeting, where we can host up to 1,000 participants now. Everybody is muted except the panelists. So don't worry, uh, uh, we cannot hear you. I need to specifically unmute you. 
yeah, the another question is a text generating recursive neural network okay for a project? It does not seem to have labels per se. Uh, we will give you more instructions on, on what the report should look like. In, we give you a, a, a required table of contents for the project, but whatever whatever you do then within the project, if you use rec uh, recursive neural networks, whatever that is, so we don't touch this at all in this, in this course, but you can use it. Um, is there a link to join the Sulip chat? Yes, it's on my courses. It's on the my courses page. Please look again if you find it, it should be on the my courses page. So uh, another question, I want to do a topic modeling using natural language processing. Is this project okay? Yes, as I said, you have all freedom. Only the sky is the limit for the student projects. Uh, we only ask you to, to uh, follow the table of contents for the project report. Another question, what is a suitable length for the final report and when could we realistically start working on it? So we will finalize the last details um, for the student project by end of round one, so by next week. And we don't, uh, I'm not a fan of specifying a certain number of, of pages for the report. Uh, maybe we set a maximum number. Uh, I don't want to have reports longer than five pages. So in der Kürze liegt die Würze, as we say in German. So short, but precise. Um, okay, so I've now worked through all the question. Um, so there's one, I'm enrolled to the course machine learning with Python. Is this course conducted by you? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm I'm kind of in the in the back office. I'm I'm the professor in charge for this Python course, but the teacher, so the front office is led by uh, Shamsi. Shamsi is the teacher <coughs> of the machine learning with Python course, but I'm kind of the master brain, master brain, or one of the master brains behind it, uh, and also the one to blame. Good. So let's now get in. To, yeah, you can ask questions, but maybe I now start to go over the content of today. So again, one of my key messages to you in this course is that you can think of machine learning and machine learning methods as combinations of three components. First component, data. Second component, a model or a hypothesis space. And third component, a loss function which is uh, used as a performance measure. So let's quickly recap data, which I have started to talk about the last lecture. <clears throat> data in a most general sense is nothing but a bunch of smaller similar units or units of, of the same type, which I call data points. So you have a bunch of atoms, so to say, each atom, which I call data point represents some object. So, and this could be anything. So one of these data points could represent the cow, and the data set is then a bunch of data points representing cows. Another example, data point could represent a whole forest. So one data point is one entire forest. Another example, a data point could represent a day, a whole day. First of March is one data point, second of March 2020 is the other data point and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> I use the term data point or the concept of a data point in a very abstract sense which makes it very versatile. So you can model almost any application domain uh, as data points, or you can think of data points in any application domain. And I ask you this also in the first assignment. The important thing is that you have to be specific when you start uh, um, formulating a machine learning problem, what do you use as data points? So what do you define as data points? Do you define data points representing, a, uh, is a data point a person, is a data point a random variable, or is a data point a machine learning problem? So in the end, the data point is just some object which can carry information. So which is, which is something that could surprise us potentially. And an object has several properties. So an object is characterized by all the properties or the attributes it has. Like in mathematics, an object is characterized by the properties, by its properties. And I like to think of two groups of properties. One group is called features. These are all properties that we can measure or compute easily. 
And another group of properties of a data point is called labels. So these are the quantities of interest or the higher level facts. And determining labels is typically difficult. Actually, the goal of machine learning is to, to develop software or hardware or systems that are able to come up with good guesses or approximations or predictions of the label of the label of a data point based only on knowing the features of a data point. So maybe we look now at some examples. So if a data point represents a protein, then the features could be everything that can be measured easily. Of course, this depends how, 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 how expensive measurement devices you have. If you have a big lab with big devices that can measure the, the structure or the three-dimensional structure of a protein, uh, all these are features. And the label could be, is this protein useful in a COVID-19 vaccine? So these were machine learning problems studied a lot during the last year and maybe still studying at uh, uh, pharmacy companies like Pfizer. Another uh, example, a data point could represent some plant and the features is everything we see. So an, an image or a snapshot of the, of the plant are features and we want to predict, does the plant need more water? Important here is again, that <clears throat> what you define as data points is a design choice. What you define as the features or what you use as the features of a data point is a design choice. And what you use as the label is also a design choice. As a machine learning engineer, there is no natural, natural choice of features of a data point or a label. So the label might come up uh, as the quantity of interest based on a customer request. So you want to develop some app. Uh, for example, you want to develop an app that makes a high precision prediction of the maximum daytime temperature based on the morning temperature. So in this case, uh, we could say we model some ski day or some day as a data point, and we can use as the features of a data point, the morning temperature. And the label or the quantity of interest in my case is the maximum daytime temperature, because this is important for the ski waxing. There's one question now. Are labels such properties that their, that their value can be measured or determined exactly afterwards uh, when certain events has occurred? Yeah, so one main uh, source of labeled data points is by looking into the past. By looking into the past, you can get, uh, you can get labeled data points, but uh, we are typically interested in in getting the label value of an arbitrary data point. So I just give you a data point and you have to tell me what is the label. For example, I give you the data point that represents this day and you, you, you are currently in the morning of this day. So I just throw you a data point and I want to know the label, which is the maximum daytime temperature. And for this new data point, you, you do not know it. You can only look in the past for, for similar data points for which you know the label in hindsight. <clears throat> On the other hand, you could ask maybe an expert. So you could ask an, a senior Finnish citizen, so really a guru for, for snow and for ski waxing and for how the weather develops. And so you can ask a human expert. Maybe I have some human experts in my neighborhood in Helsinki. Um, so the, the senior Finnish uh, ski experts, they know they have a good sense. So when it looks like this, when I look outside the window, the temperature will rise by five degrees or by 10 degrees. But since I'm not such an expert, I want to learn, uh, I want to train a machine learning algorithm to do such a prediction. Okay, so here in this case, uh, a data point is uh, some day. And where can we get data? So I also ask you in this assignment to tell me where do you think we can get data? And I downloaded it, I downloaded today uh, some data, which I get from the Finnish Meteorological Institute. They have open data uh, on the history of weather observations. So I choose here uh, daily observations. And here already, when, when I make this choice, daily observations, I kind of choose what I, what I mean by data points. So I mean by data points, days. 
if I would mean by data points some finer or some smaller time intervals, some shorter time intervals, like uh, one hour, one specific hour, I could I could also use one hour as a data point. Then I would need these observations, the instantaneous observations, which are measured, I think, every ten minutes. Okay, so. Already here at this very first step when downloading the data, I must choose or I must think of what do I mean by data points? So is one data point one day? Then I might be fine with only using da daily observations. Or do I want to use one data point to represent one hour? So I make a very high precision forecast, an hourly forecast. So in this case, I need to download these instantaneous observations. So already here, I have to, do the, I have to make design choices. Okay, so then I download uh, such a bunch of data points and each row here, so each row here is one data point, one previous day. So these are just recent days from uh, January. So we see that the, we have several characteristics. So all the columns here, these are properties of data points. So this is what I mean by properties of data points. This data point, which represents the 4th of January is characterized at least by this precipitation, precipitation amount, the snow depth, I guess this is millimeters, so quite a lot already, and the minimum daytime temperature and the maximum daytime temperature. Okay. So this, this is how data looks like or could look like a spreadsheet, but this is only one example of, of how a data point could look like. There's one question. If there are data points with features and different features would measure for different actions or labels, so can labels be seen as plural actions or only one complete approximate of a number? So I'm not sure if I really understand the question, but I just want to say you can choose several labels. So a data point can have several quantities of interest. So the quantity of interest could be the maximum daytime temperature and maybe the maximum wind speed during that day. So there are also multi. This is re uh, referred to multi-label problems. So there's one question: How accurate should the labels be? Yeah. So uh, this question accuracy. This already assumes that you have some model. So uh, when I look at the data like this, I, I can define what the label is. So if I say that the maximum temperature is the label, so then this is the true label. Period. But you might have, actually, you, you might have a model. So you might have some, and, but we will talk about models later. So it's a bit hard now to talk already about accuracy of labels because at this moment, the label is just what is written here. So these are the label values, period. We cannot say, uh, it doesn't make much sense to ask if, if these are accurate labels because in order to ask such a question, we would need some, some model or some, some kind of uh, modeling assumption that involves um, a measurement. So that, that takes into account that this temperature, this maximum temperature, this might not be the exact temperature, but uh, subject to some, some measurement errors or so. Okay, uh, one other question. Could we say the label is one of the features? Y yes, so yeah, well, at this point, at this point, so this, this annotation here is from me, what you download, what you download is just this, uh, this spreadsheet and nobody tells you from FMI, you should use this here as features. This is by me. So I choose it. I choose it because I think it might be a good idea. So you can choose whatever column here as label and whatever column you could choose as feature. So this is uh, design choices. Okay. Uh, another question, what should we do if there is a null value in some data points or features? So this refers to the problem of, of missing values. And actually what you could do, so let's say here we, we would not have a measurement. So here there was a measurement error and we would not have a maximum temperature. So what we could do is actually we could use all the data points for which we have all features and learn, learn a predictor for the maximum daytime temperature and apply this predictor to predict, to come up with a guess of this missing value. So you could learn a predictor and then use the predictor to fill up all the missing fields. This is referred to, this is called data imputation. We will talk about data imputation later in the course. So let's not worry about this problem for the time being. So I just need to check my control here.
Okay, so we just downloaded uh, the data from the Finnish Meteorological Institute, and we choose we choose the maximum temperature as the label, and all the other columns could be features. So this is just a design choice. And then <clears throat> we come already, we touch already some, some theory of machine learning. So in machine learning, we want to understand when is machine learning possible and which methods are good machine learning methods. So the first question, when is machine learning possible? And to this end, it's useful to, to, to characterize a data set by two numbers. The first number is the number M of data points. This is also called the sample size. And the second number is the number N, lowercase n, which is the number of features. This is the second key parameter of a data set. And these two numbers already tell you, uh, can you can guide you in, the, in, in uh, designing and implementing machine learning methods. Uh, roughly speaking, <laughs> machine learning is easy or you at the sweet spot for machine learning or it's an easy game when you have way more data points than features. And here is my rule of thumb. Here is Alex's rule of thumb. Always try to get uh, so many data that the sample, so much data that the sample size M is roughly 10 times larger or 10 times the number of features. Okay, so you should have 10 times more rows here than you have a number of columns that you use as features. Uh, one good question, is this rule, is Alex's rule made up or does it have uh, specific reasoning? Uh, yes, you can make this uh, reasoning precise actually in chapter, in chapter six of the course book, which I just post on the chat, you find the derivation. So if, you, if you're not afraid of some linear algebra and probability theory, you can derive <clears throat> uh, that whenever you have less data points that you have number of features, you have for, for important machine learning problems, you have no chance to learn a good predictor. So whenever you have less, if the sample size is less than the number of features, uh, when you use um, standard machine learning methods without any specific tuning, you will fail and you will fail gloriously uh, because <clears throat> when you have too little data points or too many features, you might uh, run into the risk of overfitting. But we will talk about overfitting in round four in more detail. I just here want to, to point out that it's always good to be clear about these two parameters of a data set. So the number of data points, the sample size and the number N of features. These two are very important numbers. Uh, of that characterize a data set. So they can tell you already a lot about uh, what methods you should use or what, what could be the, the risks in the, in the machine learning when applying machine learning. There's one question, is the label also a feature? Uh, so you decide what property of a data point is a label and what property is a feature. You have to choose. Yeah, very good point. Uh, there seems to be a typo, a typo in the book where the, the ratio is wrong. So the, the, there should be, there should be in order to, to have an easy game in machine learning, we should have uh, much more data points. M should be much larger than N. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, unfortunately, you are anonymous. Please send me an email with this hint that I know your name and can grant a bonus point. Okay. <clears throat> so now we have data, we have data points, we have uh, chosen the maximum daytime temperature as the label. And since uh, I now scared you a bit with the, with the ratio of number of features to the number of, of data points, yeah, maybe just to illustrate this condition here, uh, what would be the number of features that you would use for an image? So let's say you, you consider data points being snapshots that you take with your, with your Nokia smartphone. How many features can you use or could you think of to characterize an image? 
a simple snapshot that you take from your dog or your cat or your skis, how many features could you use to characterize an image? How many pixels does such a camera have or how many megapixels? Any guesses on the chat? Yeah, with times the height of an image. So uh, you're not, you're not, you would not buy a Nokia phone uh, or a Samsung phone or whatever phone. I cannot make you any advertisement uh, with one kilopixel. You want megapixel. You want sixty megapixel. So sixty megapixel would mean you could stack the pixel red, green, blue values into a vector of length sixty million. So n would be sixty million. And then say you want to predict or the quantity of interest is, does the image show, uh, show uh, a cat or not? So how many training data points would you need according to Alex's rule? Yeah, just, you just need to get 600 million images for which you manually tell this is a cat, there's a cat, there is no cat or there's a dog, there's no dog. So uh, that will not work. So this rule can hit you badly in reality. And the problem is when you use too many features without taking into account the, the large number of features by using some tricks in machine learning. And we will learn about these tricks later, like regularization techniques. But if you use standard off the shelf machine learning methods uh, and you use many features, uh, this, this uh, Alex's rule is, is tough. So, in order to, to relax this rule or the, the constraint, we could make this n very small. So the number of features are very small. And what is the extreme case? We use only one feature. We use only one single feature. So uh, according to my experience, a good feature of a data, when the data point is someday, a good feature is the minimum temperature for predicting the maximum temperature. So I just, again, make a design choice. I use as the feature of a data point, the minimum temperature and as the label, the maximum temperature. That's it. Yeah, there's one comment. This is why you would apply PCA to reduce the number of features. Yes, so instead of manually picking, so I just here manually cherry picked one feature, the minimum temperature, they are machine learning methods. Uh, they are called feature learning methods and they will be discussed in round six of this course. Yeah, if you want to cite Alex's rule, cite instead the, the machine learning lecture notes provided here. Okay, so then it's always a good idea after you have gathered some data to look at the data. <clears throat> always get some intuitive feeling for the data. This helps really. Uh, and one way to get a feeling is by using a scatter plot. So a scatter plot is a, is, a is a representation of data points by dots or blobs or whatever marker you want to use, which you place in a 2D plane, which is spanned by the feature and by the label value. So the two axes, the horizontal axis are the different values of the features. And these are the different values of the <clears throat> label. In our case, the maximum daytime temperature. And one dot here corresponds to one day. And one day is characterized by the minimum temperature, the X coordinate, and the maximum daytime temperature, the Y coordinate. And from this, you might already get some feeling, is there some relation? So this brings us now to the next component of machine learning, which is a model. Data by itself is useless. So if I just download data and plot it like this, um, yeah, I can show you the data. You can find it nice. I can send it to colleagues by email, but there's not much uh, gain of it, of data without anything else. <clears throat> to, to make use of data, we need to interpret it. We need to, we need to have a model or some idea how the data is generated or how the, the, date, how the structure of the data is. So we need a model. And in this course, I'm very specific what I mean by model. I essentially mean a set or a bunch of hypotheses. So in order to explain a model, I must first explain what do I mean by hypothesis. So the, uh, by hypothesis, I mean nothing but a function or a map. 
And here we need a bit math. So I assume you are familiar with the, with the concept of a map or a mathematical function. So a function is some, some rule that takes in some input or argument x. In our case, it's the feature value, like mi minus 10 degrees minimum daytime temperature. And it outputs something else. And this something else is our hypothesis or our prediction for the maximum daytime temperature. So the output or the function value here of this hypothesis is the estimate or the prediction for the label value of the day. And in our case, the label value is the maximum daytime temperature. <laughs> okay. Any questions? So my experience is that this component is the most difficult to grasp. Data is somewhat okay. A loss function, which I will talk later, is also okay. But uh, students struggle with the, this concept or notion of hypothesis or models. So please ask questions now if anything is unclear. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Machine learning only makes sense if you have more than one hypothesis. If you have <coughs> only one hypothesis, ah, here's a question, very good. Is there a difference between a hypothesis and a normal function? Uh, so I'm not sure what you mean by normal function, but if you mean just a mathematical function, a function f of x, then no. So in this course, a hypothesis is a function. It's just a, a more fancy word for a function. Yeah, and by the way, all this deep learning hype is just about uh, rep uh, efficient representations of nonlinear functions. So a deep neural network is nothing but a representation of a function. So machine learning does not make any sense if you have only one hypothesis. If we would only have one hypothesis, there is no machine learning to do. We would just use this function stuff in the minimum daytime temperature and get out an estimate for the maximum daytime temperature. We could code this function, implement this function in Python or in Excel or in C++. And there's not, no machine learning to do. Machine learning only comes up when you have more than one hypothesis to choose from, when you have many different potential hypotheses. Okay, here another question. Is the hypothesis space a mathematical space? So for example, do the hypothesis space contain all linear combinations of the possible maps in that hypothesis space? So I will talk about hypothesis space in a second and it can be, yes, it can be a, a space in, in the sense of having a geometric structure. So one example of a hypothesis space is the Euclidean space. And it's typically a good idea to use as a hypothesis space, uh, some mathematical space because people have developed very efficient methods to search over such spaces. Okay, so machine learning in the end, or we can think of machine learning as the problem of find a, finding a good predictor map out of a hypothesis space. So machine learning uh, is a search. Machine learning problems are search problems in some sense, and machine learning algorithms are search methods that search over large hypothesis spaces. So in this case, I only have three different hypotheses. In this case, the search would be easy. Well, I just try out this hypothesis. How well does it work? Try out this one and the green one, and then I pick the one which worked best. And I will tell you later what I, what I mean by worked best. At this point, it's not clear what I mean by that. But so the basic idea is to search over the hypothesis space for the best hypothesis. So now to discuss the notion of a hypothesis space, when you think of this, maybe the simplest case of machine learning with a single numeric feature, like the minimum daytime temperature and the single numeric label, like the maximum daytime temperature, how many possible hypotheses are there? How many maps are there which take a, a single number, let's say a real number and output another real number? Infinite, yes, uh, and very much infinite. It's, it's called, uh, mathematicians call it uncountably infinite. So very, very infinite, infinite. And uh, the only computers that I know have only finite amount of RAM or uh, finite capacity of hard disks. 
So we cannot implement an infinite hypothesis space, an infinite set of hypotheses using only a finite computer. That doesn't work. And that's why, that's why we need uh, to reduce the set or the list of potential candidate hypotheses to a subset. And exactly this subset is called a machine learning model or hypothesis space. So in this course, I use the term model uh, as a synonym for a hypothesis space. A hypothesis space is a subset of candidate hypotheses. So in this case, I have a hypothesis space containing three different hypotheses. Each hypothesis is characterized here by its graph. Okay. Another example of a hypothesis space. Uh, here is a hypothesis space consider, uh, consisting of three different hypotheses, and each hypothesis is defined by a Python code. So you can use a Python function to define a mathematical function. It reads in a number x as an argument, does some computation, and outputs some other number, which we use as a prediction for the label. And here we have three different functions. So this is a hypothesis space consisting of three different hypotheses. And we could then develop a machine learning algorithm, which chooses the best hypothesis out of those three. Another example, and here maybe the, the most simple hypothesis space, which consists only of two different hypotheses. And I characterize this hypothesis here using a spreadsheet software. So this column here, H1, is one hypothesis. And I can, I can use this column here to define a map. So the, the map is defined as by looking up. So I get in some feature value x. Let's say the feature value is minus 2. So I look at the row minus 2 and then output the value here, 1. So this defines a map. So one column here in the spreadsheet defines one hypothesis. And I have two hypotheses here defined by these two columns. So this is a rather small hypothesis space. And by the way, this is done in a spreadsheet program. So you can do machine learning in a spreadsheet software without any problem. OK, so again, machine learning is about uh, aims at finding or learning a good predictor out of a, or a good hypothesis. So sorry, uh, so I use the term predictor. Predictor is the same as a hypothesis. Okay, another example how, how, you, how you define a hypothesis space is uh, used in deep learning. So deep learning represents, represents a hypothesis maps or a predictor map uh, using a, a graph structure or a signal flow structure. So in the signal flow structure, we have the feature values the, or the input values and we multiply them by some weights. So we get this uh, linear co weighted combination of the input weights and then apply a nonlinear function, which we call activation function. But in the end, all, all this, all the purpose of this is to define a map or a hypothesis that reads in the features and outputs some number. It's just a, a graphical way to represent, to represent uh, a function. So this is only one one single neuron, and then we get very complicated functions. We can re represent very complicated functions by, uh, by connecting together many of these uh, small neurons, artificial neurons. The important thing is that this, uh, this representation of a function involves weights that we can choose or that we can tune. And these weights are then tuned in the process of learning a good predictor map. So huh, the, the, only, the special thing about deep learning is that it uses a, a graphical representation of uh, hypothesis maps or predictor maps. And it turns out that this graphical representation is, is rather clever because we can do very um, efficient search over the resulting hypothesis space. So there's one question. So all the features with their own weights have similar output. Uh, I don't understand that question. So for different, different weights here, uh, for different feature values, x, we get different output values. But how exactly this mapping is from x to the output, 
uh, this depends on, on the weights. And this might be highly nonlinear function. So it's not easy to, to visualize the resulting map from X to, to the output. Okay. Yeah, uh, as I said, uh, the hypothesis space or model or you get from an artificial neural network is the set of maps that are obtained from the same structure. So from the same edges, links and neurons, but different choice for the weights. So this weights uh, of the edges is what we tune when we train a deep neural network. Okay, I would say we have now a short break and uh, return in five minutes. See you in five minutes.
Hello. Welcome back. So there are some questions I would like to answer before I continue. Yeah, once again, there was a question about the first assignment, the, the problem you sketch in the first assignment, which you have to submit by Friday is not necessarily the one you have to use for the student project. You can look at completely different problems in the, in the student project and later on. Another question, is the machine learning with Python course supposed to be taken along with this course or can you only take the Python course and sti still learn the theory? Yes, uh, yes, you can only take the Python course and learn the theory by some other course or books, but uh, you cannot use the machine learning with Python course as a substitute for this course here. Another question, just to simplify, let's consider a linear regression model with two explanatory vari variables or features. In this case, is our hypothesis based every two variable linear regression model. And the single hypothesis is some linear regression model where the parameter values are some fixed values. Yes. Yes. So when you have two features, the linear regression model is the set of all functions or of all linear combinations of these two features. Okay, here are more questions on the chat. Let's see. Yes, thanks. Okay, there was no question. So let's continue now with the third component of machine learning, which is a loss function. What are the first two components of machine learning? Just a quick recap. Does anybody remember what are the first two components of machine learning? Data, data and model. Yeah, so the first component, maybe the most important component is data. Data are collections of data points. The second component is a model. A model consists of many different hypotheses for how the features are related to the, to the label value. And then when we have several different Hypothesis, so let's say we have two hypotheses. Two different hypotheses here, the green dash dotted curve and the orange dash dotted curve. Which one is better? So I show again the data points from the first example. So each data point represents a, a previous day with a minimum daytime temperature and the maximum daytime temperature. So I have a scatter plot and I overlaid two hypotheses. So I overlaid two maps, two functions that map uh, a minimum daytime temperature X to some value or some approximation of the maximum daytime temperature. Which one is better? Which one would you pick? H1 is better. Why? Why is the orange better? Okay, very good comment. Orange looks more closer to data. Okay, yeah. So what do you mean precisely with more closer? Less loss. Yeah, you already used the term loss. So it comes up very natural. We need to measure somehow, we need to measure somehow the, the, the distance of the predictor or of the hypothesis map from the observed data points or from the collected data points. And to make this precise, we use the notion of a loss function. So I will now formalize this concept of a loss function. So formally, a loss function is again a function, a mathematical function that takes a, a, a data point with feature X and label Y. And together with some hypothesis, like this hypothesis H here could be either uh, H1 or H2. And a loss is some rule or some function that assigns to this pair of data point and hypothesis a number which we call loss. And like the definition of data points, like the choice of features, like the definition of a label, also the loss function is a design choice. You have to choose uh, a loss function for the problem at hand. Different loss functions have different characteristics, computational characteristics and statistical characteristics. Um, so one comment here, 
so loss in machine learning is error in statistics. Uh, I'm not sure what is meant here by error in statistics, but I guess also in statistics, you use some, some notion of distance between two, two variables. So in this case, we want to know the distance between the predicted maximum daytime temperature and the actual maximum daytime temperature. And to measure this distance, we use the loss. So this might seem a bit abstract. So this, this formal definition of loss, but in the end, it's not much more. It's just some rule, some uh, rule of assignment that tells you for a given data point with known features and known label and the hypothesis, how good or how large is the loss or error incurred by the hypothesis age when applied to the data point with feature X and label Y. Uh, so I would say the best way to, to get familiar, to familiarize yourself with the concept of a loss function is by looking at examples. So one example is uh, the squared error loss. This is maybe the one most of you have heard about, but it's just one, one particular option. There are many, many other choices for the loss function. But the squared error loss is widely used and popular, and it's defined by the difference between the true label and the predicted label. So this here, remember, this output here of the hypothesis, this is what we use as a guess or a prediction. And I always indicate predictions or guesses by a head. So this is the prediction. And what, what is here in the brackets is therefore the prediction error. So this is the prediction error. And we square the prediction error. You, you could think about, you could make a thought experiment and uh, investigate how useful would be a loss function where you wouldn't take the square here. So how useful would be a, a loss function given by the prediction error? So it turns out when you square the prediction error, which is the squared error loss, uh, is useful in many applications. Yeah, so the question here is exactly, but why square without square is not enough? Well, try it out try to, to minimize just the prediction error. What, what would happen? Maybe I resolve this puzzle. What would happen if you use uh, as, as a hypothesis map uh, any linear function? So you could choose any linear function of, of one feature and your goal would be to minimize, to minimize the prediction error. Well, to minimize something means to make it as much as possible going towards minus infinity. And if you would just take the, the difference, you could make this very close to minus infinity, but just by amplifying the, uh, by making the prediction very, very large, very large positive. So you would always be able to get uh, a, a minimum, in some sense, a minimum loss, uh, minus infinity, by letting, by letting the prediction grow out of bounds. So using just the prediction error does not give you a useful criterion for the, the prediction uh, for the loss. Yeah, let's illustrate this here. So if you would use just the, the, the prediction error as a loss function, uh, so you would want to make this minimum, you would just need to move this line here up, 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 and without bound, so towards the North Pole, so to say. Then you make the prediction error minus infinity. Yeah, another question, very good. Uh, why not using the absolute value and uh, I, I didn't say that you cannot take the absolute value. Actually, you can take the absolute value and this is called the absolute error loss. So another loss function is this here. This is the absolute error loss and it's also called Huber loss because there was a statistic, st a statistician called Huber who started such loss function, Huber loss. I, I discuss these loss functions in chapter three of the course book in detail. Okay, here's another question. Uh, what does loss refer to as in what are we losing accuracy? And does referring it to as loss imply that we always formulate the problem as minimization? Yes, so whenever we talk about loss, we want to minimize the loss. So this is an objective function we want to minimize. And why is it called loss? <clears throat> I, I don't have a good answer for that. You can also translate it as error. So you can think of loss as a, 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 as a synonym, synonym for error. Uh, it might be related to if you 
if you have a big error in the prediction and you use the predictions, for example, for a business strategy, you might have real monetary loss. You might lose money because you, you used the wrong prediction for, for what customers like. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so the, the absolute error can also be used as a loss. So this is another option, absolute error loss. Uh, and as I said, different loss functions have different properties. Uh, oh my God, this is not so easy to write here. I'm sorry, absolute error loss. Uh, for example, why would you prefer the squared error loss over the absolute error? Does any student have an idea? Why is the absolute error loss uh, maybe not so popular than the... <clears throat> well, actually, yeah, but there's one good comment. Uh, the squaring the error amplifies the effect, the detrimental effect of outliers more. So when you have outliers in your, in your data set, so data points which are completely different than all others, then the squared error loss is not good. So one of the advantages of the Huber loss of this absolute error loss is that it is more robust to, to outliers. However, there is a downside. So the robustness towards outliers would favor the Huber loss. However, it is not differentiable. Uh, you cannot minimize this uh, Huber loss using a simple gradient method. We don't discuss gradient methods at any depth. I just want to point out, you can, uh, it's more challenging to, to minimize the, the Huber loss compared to the squared error loss. For the squared error loss, we can use a very simple algorithm uh, you called gradient descent, which is computationally very efficient. So we can we can search efficiently for the minimum squared error loss hypothesis. However, searching for the hypothesis which has minimum absolute error loss is more difficult. There were also some good comments on convexity. Yeah, also the absolute error loss is still convex. So at least it is a convex function. So it means we can we can use convex optimization methods to search for it, but these convex optimization methods are not as fast as the one we can use for the squared error loss. Okay, so different loss functions offer different properties uh, computational wise and also uh, regarding the behavior uh, or the statistical behavior if you have outliers or so. <clears throat> yeah, you can choose the loss function. As I said, it's a design choice. For example, here's one code snippet of Python. Don't worry, you don't have to know any Python uh, beyond just executing Python code in this course. I just want to point you, there are Python functions where one argument is you have to write down the name of the loss function you want to use. So this is a design choice. Okay, so now we have uh, completed our, our first discussion of all three components. And now it's time to bind them together. So we have three components and each component uh, has its own view on a machine learning problem. For each component, we, we put on a different pair, uh, uh, different glasses. So first we have the data view. We look at the data in the scatter plot, for example. Then we have a model view. The model is the, the set of hypotheses that map the features to the label or predicted label. And then we have another view, which is the loss function. So we can view the loss as a function or with, uh, for varying weights. So if we vary the weights, we get, we kind of move this, uh, we move this predictor function or map and get different errors. So we get a different loss. And what machine learning is then about? Well, just find the weights that result in the minimum loss, in the smallest loss. So machine learning in some sense is a special case of optimization problems. So let's look at one example and now comes the promised machine learning in, uh, in a spreadsheet demo. Just a second, I need to change the screen sharing. So can you now see my spreadsheet program? Yes, very good, thanks a lot. So I have downloaded the data again from the Finnish Metrological Institute. Uh, it comes already in the form of an Excel spreadsheet file. 
So you have one sheet, one table here, which is me metadata. It tells you the, the station, the observation station in Finland, somewhere in Finland. Ran Ranua Lentokente. Sorry for my poor Finnish pronunciation. And you find the latitude and longitude. So you can pinpoint exactly where this <clears throat> weather data has been collected and the time range during which time period it has been collected. So then here are explanation of the different properties of each data point. So we, for each data point, we have a maximum temperature, minimum temperature, air temperature, ground minimum temperature, precipitation amount, and so on and so forth. And then we have the, the meat, so to say, the data itself, which I have shown you before already. So we have each row here corresponds to one data point. And one data point has several properties. And we choose, as a design choice, we use the maximum temperature as the label of a data point and the minimum temperature as the feature. So we end up with data points being characterized. So again, here, one row is one data point, corresponds to one data point. And I just have uh, here, kept only the feature of a data point and the label. And now I bring in a model. So this is just the data and now I bring in a model. And the model is that the, the maximum daytime temperature is obtained by the minimum daytime temperature by this formula. So I use the A2, A2 is the feature value and I multiply it <clears throat> by some weight, which is here in L in cell L2 and I add some other weight or bias or offset. It's just another parameter I can tune, which is in, in this cell here. So here I have some, I choose some, some numbers. So what I get for, for these specific numbers, I get a particular hypothesis. I get a particular hypothesis, which tells me for this feature value, I get this prediction for the label value. And then I, I just copy this formula. So this formula here represents one, one particular hypothesis. Okay, so then what I do, I compute for each data point, I compute the predicted label. So I can then compare the predicted label with the true label and compute the squared error loss. So here I just compute the squared error loss. Yes, so this is now one particular hypothesis. So for, for these numbers, this is this, these two weights specify one particular hypothesis. And now the question is, what is the best choice for these numbers? So I now want to search over the hypothesis space or model, which is given by all linear, linear functions of this form, but with varying with different or, or tuning the weights here. So how can I do this? How can I do, tune the weights? How can I find the weights such that the, the, the squared, uh, the average squared error. So what I do, I, I average all these squared error losses it makes sense to somehow consider the average of all squared error losses. Huh. Yeah, how can I find those? So this is now machine learning. Machine learning is to find the best hypothesis. And in this case, each hypothesis is characterized by a particular value for the weight W1 and W0. So I have to search or optimize these weights. Uh, how do I do this? So uh, would anybody of you be able to, to write down a, a formula for the optimal weights? <clears throat> so I guess you can find one of those in chapter two of the, of the course book. At the, towards the end of chapter two, I have written down the formula. <clears throat> yeah. But uh, this requires some, some differentiation or you have to compute derivatives, partial derivatives. But there's another option. You can uh, use the solver function in, in um, Excel. So you use the solver and you tell the solver, so this is kind of an optimization uh, machine learning algorithm. You just tell the solver, what is the objective or what is the, the quantity you want to minimize? And then you tell, okay, I want to minimize the average loss. And then you tell the solver, uh, what, what are the tuning weights or the tunable parameters? Well, these are weight one and weight zero. And then you hit the solve button. And what this Excel now does is it, it searches over the space of all linear maps 
to find the one, to find the weights of the linear map, which has the best or the smallest average squared error loss. Okay, it found a solution. The solver has converged to a solution. Okay, and it came up with this. So may maybe you don't believe me. So I start with, a, I, I just choose now another hypothesis. Yeah, the hypothesis is shown here. So the orange dots here are the predicted label values and the blue dots are the, are the actual data points. So the predicted label values here, they are quite away from the actual true label values from the true Y coordinate. Because I now changed the, the hypothesis by putting here some, some uh, arbitrary numbers. So let's do again the solve. And I highly recommend you to tr you try it out after this lecture yourself to do machine learning in Excel. So we again run the solver. And it should now find the best weights. Yes, it looks good. Yes. So now you see the, the predicted the predicted label values. So this here represents the, the hypothesis, the resulting hypothesis. And for each, for each data point, we evaluate the, the hypothesis and get the predicted label here. So it's now much closer. So there is one question, how should you choose the initial values for the weights? It should be not sensitive to the initial values. You can choose whatever you want. Uh, for example, zero, zero. Huh. Then another question, how does this solver differ from least square fitting? So this is least square fitting, yes. Uh, and there are different uh, algorithms to, to find the least squares fit. So the least squares fit is the, this uh, hypothesis, which has the smallest average squared error. Yeah, the, the Excel file here is under uh, my courses section materials. Yeah, there's a very good uh, comment. Uh, the solver might not be installed by X in Excel by default. So you just Google solver in Excel and you need to, to use an add-in. But you can also use a Python notebook. So we also have on the, on the My Courses page, we have put you a, a short walkthrough video for how to, how to uh, use a Python notebook to, to find the best linear predictor with, with minimum average squared error loss. Okay, so that was pretty much it. Uh, just need to check if I have something else on my slides that I want to tell you. Yeah, so <clears throat> these optimization problems, they, they are quite easy for linear regression. Uh, or for least squares error. So it's basically minimizing a convex smooth function. So you just, you just can use gradient descent uh, methods to hop down the loss, change a bit the weights of the predictor and get better and better or smaller loss and smaller loss until you reach the sweet spot, the optimal weights with minimum squared error, uh, with minimum average error. However, uh, this only is true for simple models and the squared error loss. So deep learning uses uh, optimization, uh, involves optimization problems where the landscape looks like this. So there are many uh, local minima, so it's non-convex. It might be even non-smooth. So you might have edges or corners in the objective function where you cannot define a gradient. Uh, and it's very high dimensional. So in, in deep learning, you optimize functions over billions of weights, not only uh, two weights. So in, in our example, uh, we had only two weights. So the weight one, which was the, the slope of the linear curve and the weight W zero, which is just the offset. But in deep learning, you have billions of such weights. So you have to optimize in billion dimensional spaces. And to do this, you, you typically need a good understanding of high dimensional spaces and mathematics uh, provides tools to, to get a good uh, kind of, to navigate efficiently in high dimensional spaces. But we will not go into detail of deep learning. There are uh, great courses later on, on master level on deep learning. Okay, yes, so are we done? So we, let's say we, we found uh, the, the predictor with minimum uh, average error are we done? And the answer is of course, no, because 
even if you have a small error on the training set, it doesn't mean that you have found a good predictor. I have shown here uh, one example, this blue curve represents a hypothesis, a nonlinear hypothesis, which is obtained from a deep, uh, from a deep neural network. from a deep neural network and it pretty much fits perfectly the training set, these red dots. However, it's not a good, it's not a good predictor because this predictor would tell you for minus 20 degrees, day, a minimum daytime temperature, the maximum daytime temperature will be for sure positive, which is surely not always the case. So just minimizing the, this average loss on the training on a training set on a bunch of, of labeled data points can be highly misleading because they, we might overfit. So we might have such a big hypothesis space that just by luck, we find one nonlinear non function that fits well the training points, but it's not good at, for any data point outside the training set. So, and what can we do? Well, one of the most powerful ideas in machine learning is to use validation. So after you have trained your model or after you have tuned your weights by minimizing the squared error on some data points, you must always validate it or try it out on new data points, which have not been used in the, in the optimization of the weights. And when you then compare the validation with the training error or loss, then you spot overfitting. So when the validation error goes up, but the, the training error is small, then you have overfitting. And you will then hear in later rounds, powerful tools and methods to, to uh, reduce the, this uh, effect of overfitting or to avoid overfitting. So to bring the validation error closer to the training error. So I will not go in, into any details here. We will then talk in round four more on, on this concept of validation and how to, how to bring the validation error down and avoid overfitting. Okay. Yeah, just to wrap up today's lecture, we have now finished our walk through the three components of machine learning, which is data, a model, which is a, a space of hypo or a set of hypotheses and a loss function that allows us to uh, you quantify the quality or the, the performance of a particular hypothesis. Then learning is obtained by choosing a hypothesis with smallest or minimum error or loss. But it's then very important after you have found a hypothesis with a small average loss on the training error to validate it. And you can then, we will then learn how to diagnose methods by comparing the training loss with the loss obtained on the validation set. Yeah, uh, there's one question, how do you validate? We will then talk about validation in round four. Huh. So, uh, are there any model answers available for the course book exercises? No, for, for the, the exercise drafts in the course book, there are no uh, solutions available. And I would be happy if you uh, are interested in, in working out model solutions. Okay. Are there any questions at this point? If not, then please uh, let me remind you again about the first assignment deadline, which is on this Friday evening, where you have to submit your machine learning problem. So one to five sentences where you explain some aspect of your life, or wor including work life, uh, or free time, or sports, or hobby, uh, as a machine learning problem by identifying or defining what are the data points, what are the features, what is the quantity of interest that is uh, the label, uh, and where do you think you could get uh, a lot of such data points from? Yes, I would grant bonus points for model answers for the, for the exercises in the book. Uh, okay, since round one included chapters two to four from the book, do we need to self studies chapter three and four? Yeah, chapters three and four might be useful for the next round. So the next round, round two, will then be uh, lectured by my colleague, Professor Sick. Another question, will the first quiz be related 
to next week's lectures or have we now gone through everything related to the quiz? Yeah, we have now covered in, the, in these lectures pretty much everything you need for the first quiz. But again, as I said several times, do not hesitate to reach out to the core staff by email on the SULIP discussion forum or by joining the exercise sessions. The next exercise session is tomorrow in the afternoon, I think. Okay, thanks a lot and have a nice evening.